Welcome to Suncoast In-Depth Podcast. My name is Brett Watson, and today I am joined by a very special guest and uh, a new friend, um, Dr. Raymond Moody. Dr. Moody is an MD, psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. He is a philosopher. You have your mm -hmm. PhD in philosophy, uh, specifically Greek philosophy? Well, Greek philosophy and analytic philosophy. Okay. Yeah. So you, and everything. Really. I just love philosophy. Yeah, yeah. And you had you said you did a residency in uh, forensic um, psychology as well. Uh, yeah, I was. You know, forensic psychiatry was my favorite thing to do. I just uh, I had a situation in life in 1976 when I graduated from medical school. Was my comedy career was make, reaching its height. And I'd been doing this little stick for years and years, and it was getting more and more invitations. And so I had to cho choose whether to become a comedian or a forensic psychiatrist. So I chose yeah. murder over laughter, I guess. But <laughs> it's not a choice too many really people have to make. <laughs> I got to say, it's like, it's, it's like the... Forensic psychiatry enables you to see some of the weirdest phenomena in the universe. And uh, it's like people who chop their mother and father up in a meat grinder and stuff. And then you quickly realize that the weirdest ones you deal with are the people who were in the sane state of mind when they committed murder. Yeah. That's harder to figure than the people who did it because of delusions. The sane ones were more creative. Yeah, or just more hard to figure. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> except, you know, they all had the same first premise. I'm smarter than the police. So, <laughs> that's how they know, start out. That's how, it's all of them. That's how they, I can figure this out. <laughs> and they are wrong. <laughs> so that's fascinating. You've had a lot of really wild experiences, but you're best known for your research into near-death near death death experiences, experiences. A, a term you actually coined, if I'm yeah. not mistaken. Um uh, your best-selling book uh, was Life After Life. That was published in... 75. Yeah, I remember my friend Kevin O'Hara. You've met him. Yeah. Um, he said, I read that book when I was 15 years old. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I recently read uh, Proof of the Afterlife mm. and enjoyed it very much. Thank you. Yeah, it was great. Um, and, and in fact, because of your... I don't know if you knew this, but in the audible version of the book, uh, at the end, there's an excerpt from uh, Rajiv's uh, party's oh, book. Oh, okay, good. Um, and that's how I got yeah. turned on to that one. Yeah. Uh, so in, in um, I wanted to talk with you about some of the aspects of, of proof uh, of the afterlife, because <clears throat> what I noticed there is that this is, well, I guess the title kind of gives it away. You're, yeah. you're looking at the yeah. more objective evidence that yeah. comes from these different experiences. Yeah. Uh, and there's more emphasis, it seems, on what you're calling SDEs, yeah. shared death experiences, right. because of the more objective nature of it. Yeah. So tell us what, what you mean when you talk about shared death experience. I think a lot yeah, of people have the impression that it's it's about... Oh, um, my friend died, and I was there, and I and yeah. I experienced his death. But it's not just uh -huh. that. Well, it's quite it's a very complex thing, uh, Brett. And um, basically, it's uh, I was a professor of logic. All right, I first became known for these near death experiences when I was a professor of uh, philosophy mm -hmm. at East Carolina University because I'd known about it at, when I was a graduate student, an undergraduate student. Then I began to talk to people. And um, when I was a professor at East Carolina was when I first became known publicly for this subject because, the, the you know, the every little civic club in town needs a speaker every week. So I was it. And, and so I became known for, as the guy who studies this. And ever since then, Brett, there's been a steady stream of very likable people who come up to me and they ask, Dr. Moody, can we have a proof of life after death? And I am embarrassed to say that for years I would compute that like I would go back to logic and I would think well Bertrand Russell and Alfred North Whitehead and their Principia you know and that that Wittgenstein talks about the difficulties of proof and the, I mean and then people would just kind of drift away and I <laughs> I never really got it what they were getting at 
And I finally kind of realized a few years ago that what people are asking me when they ask that question is not anything to do about logic, as I would understand as a professional logician, but rather that they are asking a simple question, and they want to know is, is it a rational thing to expect and anticipate that when we die that there is a further extension? And I say absolutely it is. And I also will say that the reason I'm confident in saying that is that I know that the essential logical problems have been solved. It's the, the classically the logical difficulties with the question of an afterlife were formulated by the great skeptic David Hume who pointed out that it's incommensurate with the logic we use. But that has now been solved. We, there's a way to think about this that is perfectly log- rational and logical. And so I can now say, you know, from what I know personally, that, yeah, there is an afterlife, folks. And, and, I, and I'm, I am a skeptic in the real sense. Um, you know, the skeptical movement was formulated by Pyrrho, who was a, a Greek philosopher around the, just shortly after the death of Aristotle. And he was the person who formulated skepticism. And what that, that is is... Um, the skeptical movement, they knew logic very well, so they ask every question, they really bear down, but in the end, they refrain from drawing a conclusion. That's what it means. So when somebody tells you, oh, I'm a skeptic about these near-death experiences, I think it's just the chemistry of the brain, what that person is saying is, I'm a person who doesn't draw conclusions, and my conclusion is such and such. (laughs) But as a skeptic, I realize the difficulty in drawing a conclusion, but I just give up. You know, I, you, I just have so many medical friends that I would absolutely trust. For example, I am an addicted walker. I mean, I ran 10 to 14 miles every day in medical school, okay? It's not a virtue. I got to do it. All right. Now, I'll, I hate even to say this, but if horror of horrors, something were to happen to my foot, okay? What would I do? Well, I have this friend, and his name is Anthony Chicoria. And Anthony is a, prof- is a Ph.D. in physiology, an M.D., and a professor of orthopedic surgery in NYU. He's very distinguished. Well, in 1994, um, uh, Tony got hit in the head by a bolt of lightning, had a cardiac arrest, was resuscitated on the scene, but in the interim had an out-of-body experience, went all around this resort center where his family was having a, um, a family reunion, was able to tell everybody what they were doing. while mm-hmm. he, was he said, we went into this hyper-real environment. He said, this is not like a dream. This is more real than real. And then after this, Tony, who had never any interest in music, suddenly starts developing an interest in the piano. He had this recurrent dream in which he was playing the same piece of music on a piano on a concert stage, learned how to transcribe music to transcribe the piece, and learned how to play the piano. And now, in addition to being a renowned orthopedic surgeon is also a concert pianist now in in ordinary consensual reality brett that doesn't happen right right now would i take my foot (laughs) to tony yes (laughs) now how can i how can i trust my colleagues' medical judgment entirely, and they've all tell me from their own near-death experiences, yeah, this is not a dream. This is more real than reality. So I give up. I mean, I just, it's not a logical conclusion. I just don't know what else to say. I've run out of, I've run out of ways to think my way out of this. So there is an afterlife. So the, the, that's one of the common threads, it seems to me, that they they talk about hyper-reality. Yeah. That what they experience out of the body is much, they're much more uh, conscious. That's right. And things take on a different uh, realness. That's right. More real than real. Yeah, more real than real. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, that story actually is in in the book. Yeah. Um, Yeah. That guy. 
uh, who became a concert pianist. I was just telling somebody about that, in fact. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. And he's such a great guy, too. I mean, he's an Italian, and, you know, it's just the sweetest, warmest guy. Oh, my God. And what a story he has to tell, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It seems like most people that I talk to know someone or know someone yes. who knows someone who yes. has That's had right. a near-death experience. That's right. And uh, what, what, what has fascinated me over the years is uh, what I'm calling the common threads that, that show up in so many of these. So, so the, it, they are very, uh, at least the positive ones, as we were talking earlier, are very homogenous, right? They, That's right. There are many similar experiences right. between all of these folks. How many, how many near-death experiences have you actually researched? I, I just can't even estimate. It's literally thousands. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've talked to several people just in the last two weeks. I mean, it's just been that way constantly. You get those stories by email, or do they call you, or what? Well, I'm not so good at computers, but I a lot of phone calls. And mm-hmm. some people can reach me over the email when they, it's like my son gives it to me or something, but I'm not much on computers. But, yeah, I mean, it's just and, – and, you know, it's uh, – what happened, um, I can see very clearly clearly in retrospect, Brett, was these things have always happened. Plato wrote about them. Democritus Mm -hmm. wrote about them. But in the old world, they were extremely rare because the chance of somebody reviving after being dead and apparently dead in those age was practically nil. So it was very rare. But what happened, as I gather, was in the 60s and 70s, the advent of cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Now these things are in every department store, right? And so um, in the, since the 60s and 70s, there's an enormous number of people who were brought back from a close call with death. So what we're seeing is something that has always been around but was very rare but is, is now very common. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in... in proof of the afterlife you had um seven proofs Mm -hmm. for believing yeah and the one that most people well i I would say it's not the most unbelievable for people Mm -hmm. but it is one of the most i guess Mm -hmm. is the obe the outer out of body experience Mm -hmm. um why is why does the obe constitute a Improve, yeah, yeah. Well, because it's uh, this was first observed in ancient Greece. Actually, there was a guy named Hermotimus. This was about 600 BC, and he was so well known that that Aristotle mentions him. You know, is 280 years later. And um, he had the ability to leave his body at will. Mm-hmm. And this was what got the early philosophers thinking about the difference between the mind and the body. Okay. Right? And that if, if Hermotimus could go to a distance, then that means that we're made up of two things, which is more real. And uh, so, but it's just part and parcel of human nature that that happens to people. You don't have to be near death. Uh, sometimes it happens in nature, for example, when people are ecstatic over the natural beauty or whatever. Uh, sometimes it happens um, just we don't know why. Just people will suddenly pop out of their bodies. And uh, so it does seem to be part of human nature. And that is, you know, it indicates on a superficial level, at least, or at the first level, that there's at least two parts of us, right? Mm -hmm. That some part of us is the body is different metaphors. You know, some people say it's like a, a, a vehicle. Right or or a uh, vessel, a prison yeah. is what what Plato's <laughs> <laughs> analogy, and uh, but but you know it's and I've always kind of intuitively sensed this. I mean, since I was a kid, because I realized when I looked through a telescope at age seven or eight that number one, I'm never going to know much of anything, as curious as I am, but also that it's a lot of fun trying, <laughs> and that I realized you know it's like you're. The external world, you can only know by inference. This thing 
I have the same experience of this thing sitting here over and over. So I, I never infer, but some infer that therefore it is out there. I've never been able to make that inference myself. But it's um, the fact that there is that, that separation between the idea of uh, how we are inside and an objective physical world. See, that's a big leap. But most people just make it instinctively. I'm never, I just can't. You can't do it. You can't infer from the seeming persistence of external physical objects that therefore that there is an external physical world. Mm-hmm. It's we, are, we can be aware of the reality of our consciousness. You know, that's indubitable. But to infer from that is you can't really do it. Yeah. Yeah. So the 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 OBE that um, stands out to me from from the book, I, I think his last name was Richie. You, uh, it was the one that you called um, the the best out of body experience that you ever heard. Was that George Richie? Maybe. Or? Yeah, George Richie. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, George was. I was. Um, George was from Richmond, Virginia. And I am from Porterdale, Georgia. My mom and dad from Porterdale. And George Ritchie's experience took place December 20th, 1943 at Camp Barkley, Texas, when he was a recruit in the Army. And he, he was dead at least for nine minutes, according to Dr. Francie, the, the doctor there. And Two signed death certificates. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, so the ward boy, who had never seen anybody his age die, talked Dr. Francie into trying something. So the Dr. Francie int- uh, injected adrenaline into George's heart, and he came back. And he was talking about leaving his body and going, trying to go all the way across the country back to Richmond. But he got ahead there and realized, oh, nobody's going to be able to see me there anyway. So, and, uh, yeah, and, and it's, you know, I hear a lot of, Similar, I mean, this it's people do get out of their body, you know, they have a hard time finding the words to express it, but it's a very common human experience. Yeah, by the way, I first heard Dr. Ritchie in 1965 at University of Virginia, he was the first living person I heard these near death experiences from. Ten, That's the same guy, yeah. Oh. Yeah, he was the he was the first living person I knew who had an experience, and I met him. I was a philosophy student at UVA, and he was talking to philosophy group at uh, student groups. Now, years later, I, I I graduated from medical school in in make in Georgia, where I'm from. Then I decided to go back to Charlottesville for my residency. So in March of '76, I flew up to Charlottesville. Uh, to do my interviews for my residency. And at that point, I just called Dr. Ritchie. Oh, come on over. We had a nice conference. The next night, I went back to Macon, Georgia, where my parents lived. And I just mentioned casually to my dad that this Dr. Ritchie, the first living person I heard this from, that I'd been with him the day before. By then, my dad had heard a tape of Dr. Ritchie's experience. And he said the following words. He said, he said, huh. George Ritchie, Camp Barkley, Texas, December 1943. He said, you know, I was there, and so were you. My mom and dad had moved to Camp Barkley in early September 1943 so my dad could go to officer's candidate school. I was conceived in late September. George's experience was December 20th. My mom and dad moved away December 29th. So I was there in utero when this experience that changed <laughs> so my weird. life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what can you say? It, so, and it gets even weirder. Some things are just serendipitous. I mean, no, a, no. I mean, God is, is so, you know, I mean, holy mackerel. <laughs> that is. I just feel so sorry for people who are afraid of God, I tell you. <laughs> <laughs> he is the greatest entertainer there is. <laughs> no doubt. No doubt. Okay, so so when you look at a story like George Ritchie's, yeah. um, what is it about his outer body, out-of-body experience that makes it um, a, a shared death experience? Well, I'm not... 
sure that his was a shared one, but what I'm talking about is shared death experiences. Pretty much now we all know the the what we call a near-death experience is people say they get out of their body and they go through a passageway into mm-hmm. a light and they see their life in review and they come back and they, you know, they are, are rejoined with their body. And, uh, but what people don't know generally is that same experience takes place quite frequently, not to people who almost die and return, but rather to the bystanders who are not ill or injured themselves, but who empathically participate in the the dying person's near-death experience. For example, people will say, as grandma died, I myself got out of my body and I went part way up toward this light. Or people will say that as grandma died, I saw Aunt Ethel who had died, you know, come into the room or they see the apparitions or they say the room fills up with light. And incredibly to me, Brett, is I have quite a number of cases I've accumulated over the years of people who were at the bedside of a dying person who say they empathically co-lived the dying life review of the person who passed away. And this is very emotional to me because, to tell you the truth, I'm hoping to be able to recuse myself from my own life <laughs> review, right? I mean, <laughs> much less had the idea of a spectator there, like, pass the popcorn or whatever. But, you know, it's and for years I thought this had to be only people who had were intimate with the person, like a woman in Carrollton, Georgia, in about 1992, was telling me about how as her husband, they had literally grown just like one house away they grew up, and you know, from kids and the marriage, and you can imagine that bond. And as he was dying in the hospital, she said that he, she participated in his life review. And and for a long period of time, I thought that has to be somebody intimate. But oh, oh, a few years ago, Cheryl and I got a communication from an emergency room doctor who was called to the ER to resuscitate a patient he had never laid eyes on. And he said as he was resuscitating this guy, this, says, this guy's life just came up around him in a, a hologram kind of. So, you know, this is stuff, and people are, you know, I've been talking about shared death experiences for 30 years now, Mm -hmm. Brent, and this just doesn't catch on, and I think I know why. And that is, when it's a near-death experience, it's the story of this other guy. He almost died, and he and he almost died, and then he came back, right? Yeah. And so that was something that happened to the other guy. But I think people find it easier to imagine that they might be there at the death of someone else. So, so this is uncomfortable to yeah, them. Yeah, that makes and sense. And we don't have, you know, Plato and Democritus set out the framework for how we still think about these near-death experiences. Some people say, like Plato did, oh, this is an indicator of an afterlife. Democritus, who had figured out that contrary to our experience of solidity, this thing is made up of tiny little bits he called atoms. And he, and he, he, he once he realized that from reasoning it out, they could see it like the statue over there, you know, it's gradual attrition. Over, so there's little particles coming off that that we don't see yeah. but um but because of the power of that framework see people don't want to hear about the shared death experiences it's uh, it doesn't fit into the framework but this is just as common maybe more common than near death experiences but it's something that for some reason people just can't make the step yet but they got to do it soon cuz i mean this is a very common thing well, I feel like there's, generally speaking, there's more and more openness yeah. to talking about these things. Yeah. Because, you know, years ago when I first started you know, reading on near-death experiences even, people, they, they'd cock their head and look at me like I would, you know, had a screw mm-hmm. loose. Um, despite the, what I would say is a lot of evidence. Um, yeah. You know, you said yourself, you, you, you just can't, you just can't not believe at this I can't point. figure out any way of thinking otherwise. Yeah. I mean, it's not the oxygen deprivation to the brain because why would the bystanders have the same experience if right. not ill or injured? I remember uh, a couple of years ago when we first met, um, I asked you 
about uh, an experience that I had. I, I had the opportunity to um, interview Mike McHarg. He, he's known as Science Mike. He has a podcast. and He came here for a, an event that we had, um, and he spoke. And, and I asked him about near-death experiences. He's had a mystical experience himself, mm-hmm. and he wrote a book about it. Um, but when I asked him about near-death experiences as you know, as evidence for an afterlife, he said, oh, no, those are all just uh, constructed mm-hmm. memories. Mm-hmm. I don't think so. No. And the but shared they are death threatening to people. They yeah, are they are. They are. Yeah. And, and, I, and I get that. Um, yeah. I don't think it was threatening to him, but it, 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 it kind of surprised me, actually. That threatens he, his he, ideology. He blew maybe. it off. I, I don't know. He just kind of blew it off. I don't know. Yeah. It really surprised me. But anyway, I, I want to go back to the George Ritchie story because mm-hmm. what I meant by a, a shared death experience um, and maybe I'm misunderstanding the the, uh, the definition. Really, the what he experienced in his out of body um, journey, uh-huh. uh, he was later visiting one of that's the towns right. that's with right. another yeah, traveler. That's right. And and that and he told Vicksburg, the traveler, Mississippi. "There's a diner right around the corner." Over that's there. right. What what city was it? Vicksburg, Mississippi. He said a year later, he and his friend were coming back from Texas and going to the east, and they went through Vicksburg, Mississippi. And he said, "There's stops. There's a diner right around the corner." And the the friend said, "I thought you said you'd never been here. I haven't, but but it was where he had seen." Where he went through on his out of body trip, trying to get back to Richmond, and he said several other his friend his friend kind of tested him, right? That's right. And and he knew where to go for this or that. I mean, he could. Yeah. yeah. Um, so so does that constitute a shared death experience? Well, I then? think because you know you're right. It, it does. I mean, in the sense that it it was a year later, but I mean it was shared in the sense that his his friends obviously participated in that. Yeah. Okay. So another question that I have, um, I, I've, what I've been doing in this class is is trying to draw the the common threads that I see between near death experiences, shared death experiences, um, uh, and uh, uh, regressive hypnosis uh-huh. uh, therapy, um, and all the cases that have been collected by guys like um, Dr. Michael Newton and and Dr. Weiss. Uh, who both, by the way, mentioned your books. <laughs> you, yeah. uh, so they were contemporaries of yours, really. Um, yeah, friends. Dr. Weiss is still working. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Do you know them personally? I, I, know, I know Brian. haven't met Michael much. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in, in, those, in those, one of the common threads, or several of the common threads, between those uh, deep hypnotic, you know, those trance states, and it doesn't just happen in hypnosis, it seems to happen in deep meditation, too. Yeah, or sometimes just spontaneously. But one of the things that keeps popping up there is people are living these other lives. Yeah. They're remembering these other lives. Um, how often do NDEs, the stories that come in uh, of near-death experiences, include in past life? Reincarnation memories. It's, in my experience, it's rare. And, and I will say the first... Years I was doing this research, I was living in the Deep South. And even in that circumstance, there were two particular people I remember who had, as, and, both, and the, uh, both of them had been Baptists, from my background. But both of them, as part of their near-death experiences, recalled past lives. Hmm. And this one woman I got to know very well, her name was Vi Horton. She, and uh, she had one of the most astonishing experiences I've ever heard. Her, her doctor, Dr. Nelson, told me, he said, you know, it just totally changed his life. He said, Raymond, she was dead. For 40 minutes, she was dead. 40 minutes? Yeah, and, and it was the strangest story about how he chose to try and resuscitate. It, it, I mean, it's just basic. I, I don't think any of these folks are still around anymore, but uh, it's basically um, what happened was that he, the doctor was, his daughter was a friend of Vi's daughter, and they had grown up together. And so the doctor just couldn't face going to tell Vi's daughter that she was dead. So he, he said to the nurse, little try one more time. And he did, and she came back. 
And he mm-hmm. said he came back, she came back with a laugh. And Dr. Nelson told me, he said, that was the weakest and the best laugh I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she got out of her body and she was, her relatives were there at the hospital. And she was out of her body watching all this, and she saw her brother-in-law standing there by himself. But she said then a friend of his had happened to come by and, uh, and said, oh, what are you doing in the hospital to the friend? And, and, the fr- and the, her brother-in-law said, well, I was going to Athens today to visit Uncle Henry, but it looks like Vi is going to kick the bucket. Oh, so I remember I better this. Go, yeah. <laughs> go to, i got to be a pallbearer at her funeral. And, and she, when she, he came into the room a couple of days later, she said to him, she said, well, the next time I die, I want you to go on and be with Dr. Henry. Uncle Henry, because I'm going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so again, that's a that's a that becomes a shared death well, experience yeah, because there are other people right. that can that's corroborate. Right. That's a good point. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, but the the more fantastic shared death experiences were. Uh, I think this was your story, if you don't mm. mind sharing it. Oh yeah. Um, when your when your mother passed. Yeah. Um, I was sure, that getting, one. that is the strangest thing too. I was getting ready, I was out west and I was with a group of folks where we were thinking about some way to investigate shared death experiences. And mm. then it was Mother's Day of 1994, it would have been. And just after the conference was over I, at a shopping mall, I called on the, on the payphone i called my mom to wish her a mo- happy mother's day how are you doing oh i'm doing great yesterday though i developed a rash my brother and sister had taken her to the doctor he didn't think there was anything wrong but next day like monday come back for another appointment so on sunday everything was fine on monday when she went to the to the um, doctor he said you have non-hodgkin's lymphoma and you have two days to two weeks to live oh my and she did she let two two weeks later to the day she expired but as she did i and my wife and my brother-in-law and my sister like my sister felt the presence of my father who had died 18 months there before my my brother-in-law had this profound experience and to me i don't know how to describe it except like the room changed configuration it's like you were in a like a double funnel it's just hard to describe and the light quality changed and there was an energy like the whole geometry of the room changed and i heard mom talking but not through these ears i it was just I, you know i heard her voice but she was not speaking now, did you did you all see your father there? I, I think my sister did, but I, I didn't. My my main fascination with it was this whirling or the the energy shift, and how you you hear your mother not talking through your her through her voice box, but through something else. And you, you know, this sounds so crazy, but a lot of people listening to us are going to say, yeah, that happened to me, too. It's just mm-hmm. very common. I've been at you know several deathbeds as a pastor, mm-hmm. and um, one of the things that I've, I've witnessed personally is um, what, what you refer to as terminal lucidity. Yeah. Uh, so my own grandmother went through a period of terminal lucidity uh, when she was in hospice, mm-hmm. where she actually graduated out of hospice. Um, it lasted so long, wow. and I, I, that's kind of rare, isn't it, yeah, that, that it would yeah. last that long? Usually that's they're right. gone that day. That's right. That's um, right. But she, they, they, you know, the doctor said, well, okay, she can go into, you know, she needs to go into another home because yeah, yeah. we don't know how long she's going she's yeah. gonna to hold on. Um, but uh, when she, 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 had, she had fallen in her apartment, and mm-hmm. she... Um, when they finally found her, I think it was my mother that was calling and calling and couldn't get her. Mm. And so she had been on, on the floor for like two days or something like that. And, and, uh, and she had experienced a heart, at, uh, a heart attack. Mm. And, um, she, as a result, she was somewhat demented, mm-hmm. you know, but when she came into this terminal lucidity, the mm-hmm. dementia seemed to just yeah be gone and and be more more than her normal. 
Yes. Yeah. 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 I mean, I've seen it so many times that when people you describe this to people, they don't believe it, (laughs) but it happens. (laughs) And then, and then, even more fascinating to me, this wasn't my grandmother, but uh, are those cases where people are who are born blind? Yeah. They they can describe what they see when they have their outer body experience. Yeah. I have a great memory about that in 1976, shortly after my book was published. They called me to Long Island to an Episcopal church, and they were going to have us, they were going to get me to talk about the near death experiences. So I was introduced by this very distinguished surgeon who was affiliated with the hospital. And he began his introduction. What's this kind of guy say? He said, you know, uh, two weeks ago they came and asked me, to told me about this, got me to read this book, and they said they wanted me to introduce this guy and say what I thought. I, well, I'd never heard of this, you know, after all these years. And he said, and so I just started asking. He said, they asked this woman who had been blind since the age of 18 that he had recently resuscitated. And he said, and I asked her, you didn't have one of them experiences. And she said, well, if I did, doctor, I wouldn't tell you. But then she loosened up and she said, yeah. And she told him all about getting out of her body and seeing. And he said she was able to describe things in the room. And so, you know, he was blown away. Yeah. Because it's like this is not something people notice until they bring it. you bring it to their attention. See, And then once they can... They, you know, one of the funniest things happened to me in um, my first lecture on this to a medical society was in November of 73. No, November. Uh, yeah, yeah, it must have been 73. And um, no, no, no. The first lecture in the medical, when I was in medical school, my first lecture on this was to the Milton Antony Medical Society. I was still a first year medical student in Augusta, Georgia. And so the, uh, so they asked me just to talk about what I'd found. And so, you know, I talked about the experience and then uh, the hand went up from one of my own professors, Professor Yoder. And, um, he said, well, I've been in medicine for a long time. He said, I've never heard of this. And, I wanted. and so by then I knew that soon that an audience this size, somebody would have. So I said, well, has anybody else heard of this here? And I swear to God, his wife <laughs> held up her hand <laughs> and started talking and everybody. You know, Lance <laughs> his was. wife. But, I mean, it's just like it's people don't notice this, really, because it's, it's too threatening for many people. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't. I, I can't relate to that. To me, uh, all of this is so hope filled. Yeah, me too. So uh, because Brett, because you have the a wonderful capacity that I do too of being able to say I don't know. There are some people <laughs> yeah. who are just terrified to say I don't know, so they will do yeah. anything. Yeah. To have to, you know, not. Yeah, have to say, and you get painted know. into a corner. If, yeah. you, if you let fear um, strip you of your intellectual honesty, yeah, and you pretend to have certainty about things that you really don't have yeah. certainty about, then you paint yourself. Especially religious folks, they paint themselves into these dogmatic corners. Yeah. Um, and they can't let go of that for fear that their the reality that they have constructed yeah it will crumble around them yeah. and and i get that um, it is it is but it would you know I, talking to christian groups you know um i'll often say well do you think that god would call you to be an honest person mm-hmm. yeah. and they always say yes yeah. uh then then why not be honest about this you, yeah you know i realize it's difficult but be honest. Yeah. Just admit when you don't it's know something. Because I know, I mean, to me, it's curiosity really drives me, man. I know you too. I just, I can't understand why anybody would be afraid to know something. I just, it makes no sense to me. Because at age seven it. or eight, I was an, um, uh, an avid astronomer and still am. And, and, um, I remember at seven or eight looking through that telescope. I was a very curious 
driven person. I just all curiosity drove me all my life. And uh, I looked through that telescope, and I remember having the thought that, number one, I'm never going to know much of anything. Yeah. But that, number two, <laughs> you can know a little bit, and that's fun. Right. right? And yeah. to me, knowledge is fun. It's, mm -hmm. it's, but some people are just so threatened, and I never have been able to get it. I just don't understand it. No, I don't either. It, maybe it has to do with God because, you know, some people are afraid that God is like their harsh daddy or you know, something. But, dang, mm -hmm. you know, God is, uh, I tell you, man, it's... Um, I just talk to God every day. He's never said a word to me about religion, by the way, and and uh, or the Bible. And he seems to sort of take me where I am. <laughs> and he has a great sense of humor, too. <laughs> and you learn at a certain point in your life that you got to turn it over. See, it's just like my prayer is, God, just, I just surrender it to you. I was uh, some years ago, this was back in the 70s, I'd been stewing about some obsessive thing it's this situation is just tormenting me over and over and over and i've been going on for a couple of weeks so i just find i just you take care of it all right and then of course as you know next day it went away right and so a couple of days later i was talking to george and i mentioned that series of events and he said surrender is the most powerful prayer yeah yeah, yeah, I believe that. Me too. Yeah, yeah. I think the notion of prayer for most people is is about asking for what you perceive as your you needs yeah. or things that you want. Yeah. Um, but I think it was Richard Foster who said, "No, no. to pray yeah. is to change." Yeah, just lead me in God. You show me how to do it, and I'm I'm just you know letting myself go, and you and it all, always works. <laughs> but it's still scary to think about. <laughs> it is. Yeah. Um, the last thing that I want to I want to talk about while I have you here, um, I hope we can do this again because there's so oh, many. Oh, absolutely. I have. I and have a long next list. time I'll bring my Amway samples. And I, hey, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I forgot to turn this off earlier. Now my wife will yell at me later because I won't answer it when she calls. Um, well, I, I actually, I, I did start to ask about this, but you said that in near-death experiences, you, you don't usually run into uh, reincarnation stories. Not not the, commonly, but, oh, I, I got off on the thing about Vi, but uh, Vi, who was a Southern Baptist, when she had her very profound near-death experience, she said that she, this life review she had, and she said coming off from specific little events in her her life, there, there were these filaments, she called them, of light that would go back and touch on things that had happened in other lifetimes. Interesting. And there was this one thing. Vi lived in this same house on Laurel Street in Augusta all her life. And um, and I knew her, everybody in her family, who two grown, her older sisters and her father. Her mother was dead at that time. But um, I... Um, uh, when Vi was three years old, as her father and her sisters told me, she ran out in the street in front of her house on Laurel Street, and a car coming by had to slam on brakes. This was before seat belts, and a child front, front, standing in the front seat who was three years old was killed. Oh, jeez. Right. Now, Vi said, and, and when she, in that event, in the, her life review, she said there was like a filament like that was going back and touching on this thing. She said she had no idea where it was, but it was like the horse and buggy days. And she said this time she was sitting on the front seat as a three-year-old on the buckboard, whatever you call it, and a child that she recognized as the child who was killed and the came running by and the driver had to hold back on the reins and Vi was killed. Wow. You know, and that doesn't make any sense in terms of retribution or it's, it has, it makes sense in terms of um, you always want to see how, how something happened, was how you were involved in, how it affected the other people. 
Yeah. You know, you want to see that. And uh, God has arranged for it. I mean, it's just the most amazing thing. So then why do you want to recuse yourself of your, your, uh, your well, own life? Well, because it's so embarrassing. <laughs> I mean, it really is. I just, oh, my gosh. Uh, uh, I'd, be, I, I, I'd be willing to bet that almost everybody would like to avoid that. some of that. I bet yeah, so. I yeah, bet so. yeah, yeah. Um, and this is where uh, I was talking to you earlier about. This was the other thing I wanted to ask you about was the um, the hellish experiences. Yeah, and and you said that they're very infrequent. You, first of all, um, usually. They don't have a hellish experience. That's right. It, it, but you can't tell for sure whether that's because it's just people are more rel- reluctant to say a hellish experience. Well, that's I true. Don't know. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, it seems to me that they're very rare and they're also very variegated. It's like, um, whereas the positive ones have a more homogeneity, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, the negative ones are spilled all over the place. And a lot of the ones I've talked to um, have been obviously to me delirium. It's delirium is described in a certain very surrealistic way. And it, the way these people were describing it to me, it sounded like a delirium. Okay. Whereas a near-death experience is not a delirium. It's it's almost the opposite of a delirium. And and to be religiously fixated like like more fundamentalist groups are oh. on hell. Yeah. Um it, it would make sense then, wouldn't it, that that the only near-death experiences that I've watched or read that had a hellish component with one exception which was uh Rajiv Party um were Fundamentalist Christians, yeah. a fundamentalist Muslim, uh-huh. and an angry atheist, I call them. Yeah. Well, I tell you the truth. I was in 1967 or 68, Brett. I was a graduate student in philosophy at the University of Virginia. And I, one of my best friends was the guy who got the entertainment for UVA, so I always had good seats. And this one time, this Broadway musical comedy came through, like a touring group. And they came for a one-night show in Charlottesville. And I was on the front row, okay? And this, I don't remember which comedy it was, but it had a really great comic villain, complete with a black high-top hat and a black cape, okay? okay? And so... This, you know, I don't remember much about the play, except the villain was just so terrific. And then the curtain went down, you know, and then the the hero and heroine came out and, <laughs> you know, and then yeah. the the supporting actors and actresses swooped down and together, and, <laughs> right? Yeah. And then the villain came out, <laughs> and since I was sitting on the front row, it was very palpable, almost. Silence. <laughs> and and it seemed like it went on for an eternity. I'm sure just a couple of yeah, seconds, but yeah. it seemed like so long. And then, since I was on the front row, like, all of a sudden from the back, you hear simultaneously from different parts of the auditorium, like, this sound like, oh! <laughs> as people are coming back to reality and then you hear scattered applause and it grows louder and louder and louder and louder and pretty soon he got the greatest applause of all right and i think to me that's how the villains in my life now i don't know about hitler or stalin you know i'm not i'm just talking about the normal run-of-the-mill villains that we all encounter. Mm-hmm. And I, you know, the older you get in life, the more you see the roles the villains played in your life were pretty good, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that kind of, yeah, that's that's kind of a and I think non-dual God is, version you know, of things. Just, yeah, God must... Is, uh, I just think hell is nonsense. You know, the idea of punishment implies justice, right? Mm-hmm. It's like that the blind woman with the... the scale, right? And the idea that somebody could be burned eternally, infinite torment, infinite eons after eons for a brief human life spell, which, and normally why they want to send you there is some ideological infraction, right? Mm -hmm. You don't believe in the Trinity, you're going to hell, you know? And and it makes no sense. Even Athanasius said that. (laughs) It's, It's like, it's like, um, you know, the idea of an eternal punishment for a brief 
is 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 nonsensical. It doesn't make any sense. It's you know, not just. It really doesn't. It really uh-huh. doesn't. Even even from a a theistic, you know, what most people, what most theists believe about God, right? If you just play it out, if he's all loving, perfectly loving, mm-hmm. he's omniscient. Yeah. He, she, it, whatever, um, is omniscient. Then that means that. God is also foreknowing. Yeah. And they all believe that. Yeah. Any theist I've ever talked to that believes that or read. So that means that God decided to create someone that he foreknew would spend eternity in torment. Yeah. yeah. And, and they, it's almost like they unknowingly make God the worst of villains. I know. It's just, I mean, I just know. I mean, I don't quite get it, but it's... To me, I just tell you the truth. It's like there's a hateful component in that behavior. That's the fact. And it's like how can we overlook that, that these people who tell you because, you know, that you don't understand the fourth chapter of Matthew as well as they do, you're going to hell. I mean, I'm sorry, that's just human meanness. That doesn't have anything to do with God. (laughs) And I think fear, too. Fear, yeah. They get mean because they're afraid. Um, But it's interesting. In in Matthew, what is it, 25, it's probably the most quoted passage about, you know, when people are defending this notion of hell. Mm -hmm. And it's where it's the the parable of, of the sheep and the goats. Mm-hmm. And Jesus says, um, the kingdom of heaven is like this. And he has several parables there. But uh, this one says the, the, the goats are those who uh, are on his left and the sheep are on his right. Mm-hmm. And the goats are those who did not um, take care of those in need. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, 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 and Jesus says, you know, when you didn't do for the least of these, uh, you didn't do for me. Yeah. And when you did, and when these did do for the least of these, they yeah. also did it for me. Yeah. And those on my left, the goats will, uh, well, those on my right will go to eternal life. Mm-hmm. Okay. I años Zoe. Mm-hmm. Those on my left will go to I años Colossus. So the Greek word it? Colossus, used by Matthew there, whoever that is, uh, is has its roots in agriculture for pruning. Okay, so it, and it was Colossus was never used in Greek literature that I know of, uh, unless it was used to um, speak of corrective punishment or oh, or, okay. or reform. Yeah. Well, I sure need some of that, I tell you. Yeah, right. All of us do, (laughs) right? So I remember talking to a a seminary student who was touring. He was uh, the brother of one of my volunteers. He came to um, Holy Cross where I was youth pastor, and and he did a little concert, you know, to raise money for school and whatnot. And afterwards, I was talking to him, and those were my more fundamentalist days. And so I was talking to him about um, the more liberal aspects of the school that he was attending. He was at the, uh, at the Chicago Seminary. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, this whole notion of universalism, you know, um, what do you do with passages like Matthew 25? He said, well, I don't know about you, Brett, but I got some goat in me that I'd like to see go away. Yeah. Yeah, me too. And it, yeah. it, right, it, it, it yes. made perfect. That was the first it's, time. It's a nice little thing that there's some way to straighten all this out after you get out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think that that's what this these this research that you've done and others have done. You said the University of Virginia, right? That yeah, I that's where UVA. Grace Bruce Grayson is. Bruce right? it was there. It still is, but he's still retired is. now. Oh, he yeah. is. Mm-hmm. Okay, um, did. An enormous amount of research into near-death experiences, he has. also. And I, I met Bruce right at the time. That was, I went to there to my residency in July '76 at UVA, and Bruce was then the emergency room and psychiatry director there. So that's how okay. we met. Okay. And I had done my book, and he, you know, he was interested in it, and he had found a patient too at that time. 
So you yeah. I guess that your research there changed his career trajectory, right? Well, it, I mean it did, but I mean I you know, it's it, we were all in this together. I mean, yeah. I just happened to be the but and and you know, it's I'm so grateful to that my colleagues like Bruce and and Michael Sabom and others, they rather than just saying I'm crazy, they looked around among themselves and they found the same thing. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, I appreciate all that you've done and all that they've done and, mm-hmm. and are doing. Um, and, uh, I just think that it's, it's worth sharing this stuff with people mm-hmm. because the, the truth is that most people fear yeah. their mortality. Yeah. And what all of this points to is that you really don't need to be afraid of it. No. And, and, you know, it's like I have over the years, a lot of people have come to me from fear of death, right? Mm-hmm. And so the first question is, what is it that you fear? It's like there's all, a lot of different things. Some people, and I put myself in this category, pain. And I don't want any pain. I've had kidney stones. I've had gallstones. I'm oh, finished with pain. Hope that I get through it without pain. Other people are afraid of, you know, the separation from their loved ones. Count me in. You know, I want to stay with my family. But, I, you know, I know that, it, you know, I want to make things good for them before I leave here. Um, but then other people are afraid of the unknown, mm-hmm. you know. Some people are afraid of hell. Um, and, you know, there's different things that people are afra- afraid of about death. But obliteration is one of them, some fear. But no, that's that's not going to happen. No. Mm-mm. No. That's a funny one to be afraid of. It is. Because it is. you're it's not going to care what you're obliterated. That's right. That's right. And, and David Hume pointed that out. He said, why are people afraid of death? He said, you just go back to where you were before. But that itself is a fallacy. Yeah. You know, people say, well, you just go back to where you were before. But you weren't anything before. Right? So. Yeah. I guess Brian Weiss wouldn't agree with that. But, uh, <laughs> oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Well, this has been so fun. It has been, Brad. I, mean, I hope we can do this again. This I mean, you were on great. Oprah, weren't you? You were on Oprah. I've been once. on Oprah a few times, but yeah. you know, I never. Those talk shows, I just, I mean, I, I never liked being on them. No. No. Well, I've been on here one in Sarasota. This is wonderful woman here, but. It's normally those big things that's, like, too show-like for me. Well, I appreciate you being willing to <laughs> come on to our little oh, church podcast. Oh, no, no, this podcast is different. And, this is like a conversation yeah, I'm talking about. Yeah, I enjoy it. You know, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for what you thank do you, and, and the hope that you bring many and, uh, you know, through your own, your own curiosity about all this. You and, know, I think you might be interested to know Bernard of Clairvaux said— some people seek knowledge for the sake of knowledge, and that is curiosity. Some people seek knowledge to be known, and that is vanity. <laughs> and some people seek knowledge to help others, and that is love. Oh, that's beautiful, and isn't it? I, you know, I, my wife is definitely that third type. I'm the first type. I've never been able to be the second type because I realized when I was seven years old, I'm never going to know much of anything. Yeah. So, you know, the vanity part, I'm, my vanity is displaced to other things. But the, um, you know, that's so true. And I, what I find myself in my own life is that I, as time goes on, I'm getting more. It's the curiosity is still there, but I'm getting more and more toward the other side, too, of the love. That you, because you realize anything you, lo- you learn can potentially help somebody else, especially if you're in like right. psychiatry or medicine. I, I'll, I'll confess something. Maybe I won't have to go over this in my own life review, having done this. But for many years, I struggled with... I, I realized about myself that I wanted to know things that other people didn't know mm. so that I knew more things than other people. Oh, okay. And that's the vanity thing. Yeah. Well, so, see, I've never gotten into that because to me it's like anybody can know it's just a tiny, you know. That, that's right. So, yeah. No, that's true. But I wasn't yeah. smart enough to realize that. Wow. But I, did, I was conscious of the fact that I was doing that. Uh-huh. And, and I worked for years in my own prayer life. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to know in order to love people. 
yeah. to pass on things that would mm. be seen as helpful and I think hopeful. that's part of development, uh, Brett. I've noticed, for example, that phrase, uh, the happiest life is a life of service to others. Yeah. You remember hearing that as a kid, and it's an ideal. You hear it as an ideal. Then you get into midlife, and it's more like a aspiration. But by the time you get to age 79, it's a fact of experience because you learn that whenever you're in it for yourself, you're always miserable. It's true. It's, it's so true. It is. It <laughs> it's is. It's like all around the world, I've said the same thing. It's like I learned as a psychiatrist several things. I learned, number one, what normal is. Normal is somebody you don't know very well. <laughs> All right. I like that. And uh, and and uh, the other one is ego, and the simple formula is ego equals pain. You know, if I'd said that I'm finished with ego because I burned the incense and I laid down on the bed of nails and I went up on the mount to talk to Guru Wahami, that's vanity. But to me, the way I just like I just almost killed myself with ego is where I got out of it. And, uh, you know, mine was jealousy. But, you know, one ego trip is enough is what I've learned because they all have that same struggle. And once you get out of that, you know, like that ego itself is pain. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. But, yeah. but that's not highfalutin sound. It's just a fact of experience. Everybody knows that when they're 70-something years old. I think you're right, yeah. 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 I think everybody knows it at some yeah. point in their life, yeah. usually when they're older, that mm -hmm. ego is pain. I like that. Yeah. That sounds like something the Buddha would have said. Mm -hmm. Oh, he said, life is pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much for thank doing this. You. I really appreciate you and, and all that too, you do. Me too, Brad. This is just delightful. I'm so, I've been sick for about three years, but I'm just so glad to get back with you. I've just been through a terrible ordeal from one point of view, although, you know, it's just, I'm trying to think up, I'm getting, get me set up a Somalia uh, sympathy line. So I'm going to hire three or four little Somali kids, and they're going to sit there in front of a computer, and all of us Americans are going to be able to complain about our troubles to them, and they're going <laughs> to offer us sympathy. <laughs> They'll probably be good at it. <laughs> Thanks again. Thank you.